This is The CW Spiral, a podcast run by three survivors of the CW's calling in 2022. We're your hosts, Sabrina Reed, Michael Patterson, and Reed Gowden, bringing you history about the network and the WB, the latest news and in-depth sportable discussions of the best and messiest shows to ever grace the small screen. So we are starting this episode with some news, some exciting news, because we finally got the premiere date for Wild Cards, Vanessa Morgan's new show. It's coming out Wednesday, January 17th at 8 p.m. And the trailer has dropped, too, so we're going to react to that as well. Uh, But just to remind you, she's playing a character named Max, who is a con artist, who, as a get-out-of-jail-free card, is going to be working as a consultant with a cop. So it's giving comedic procedural. And it is definitely her vehicle because the trailer is basically Vanessa G- uh, Giacomo is in it and he's doing his thing. But it's clearly she's they're both the leads. But to me, she feels like the lead lead, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. She's serving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Looks like Big so time. much fun. Mm hmm. Uh, Jason Priestley is also going to be in it, which Reed, you were saying this again continues the pipeline for the 90s heartthrobs being CW dads. I am over the moon. I think I all caps <laughs> uh, celebrated in our chat when the news dropped because like Jason Priestley is like my epitome. I was a Brandon Walsh girly. Like I love him. He's my favorite. And I... It's 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 time, but it it feels right because he's he's our Canadian king, and this is very Canadian. The show, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it feels like the right time for him to be a CW dad. But but yeah, the pipeline is one of my favorites. We had Luke Perry. We had um, why am I blanking on his name? Um, Carson Drew, Scott Wolf. Yeah, <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> sorry. sorry, Scott. I love you. <laughs> I'm sure there are more '90s heartthrobs that have been CW dads, but those are the like the it's like. My Mount Rushmore is forming. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good to see a man. And it, it feels so odd that it's come from a Canadian show, obviously, since we were acquiring shows these days. But like we said before, when we heard about the show, that elements of it felt very CW-esque, there is another one. So this is taking all the right boxes and it's starting to feel like a CW show on the CW again. And it's been a while since we've been able to say that, right? Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. It's very much too long. And it's like the one besides like Family Law Season 3, which is also coming out Wednesday, it's the 17th at 9 p.m. Um, it's the only premiere. Those are the two only premiere dates that we have so far. Like, and I hold them closely to me because <laughs> I need more premiere dates. Uh, but as far as Jason goes, he's playing George, who's Max's father and himself. He's a master con man. Uh, he is, he taught his daughter everything that she knows. He's very charming. Apparently, he's like the kingpin of jail because he has influence amongst the inmates and with it's the guards. It's so funny because Jason Priestley is. The sweetest guy. <laughs> and I'm like, I hear this and I'm like, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> he is so sweet in the trailer. When they he's she's just sitting there saying, Dad, guess what? I'm a cop now. And she's like, What? <laughs> got a, you got a badge and everything. The chemistry. i I felt it. The father and daughter chemistry. Yeah. I, I, th- I think they're gonna be like the best dynamic on the show, probably. Mm-hmm. Like, Although, I mean, the we had like whispers of the the um dynamic between Max and I don't know Giacomo's character's name. Do we know his name? Oh, is it Ellis? I think it's Ellis. That sounds right. Um, but like I'm already shipping because like I I'm like I've seen these shows before, so I'm like, I know what we're in for. Mm-hmm. And like that first clip in the trailer, did we did I move us into the trailer reaction? <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead. Let's move into it. Let's do that. <laughs> but that first clip when like and I think it's the beginning when they she's in the detective's office and he comes in and it's very much a moment where she first mm-hmm. sees it for the first time. And you can tell with that grin, like he's in for it. Like he's met his match and I'm so excited. <laughs> right. No, I love it as well. And I feel like I love when we have re- two reluctant people who don't want to work together and suddenly they have the time of their lives and they're such a good team and they don't want to admit it. This show isn't going to reinvent the wheel, but it's using that show so well. And from a what, two minute trailer, I'm drawn in. It's so unserious in all the right kind of ways. There's And I mean, you know what? We don't need the wheel to be reinvented. Sometimes we just need the wheel and we need mm-hmm. the yeah. wheel done correctly. Mm-hmm. And it, you, sometimes they're just not doing that. Like, come on, give us the wheel. 
yeah we wheel <laughs> exactly <laughs> and uh, it, it's i feel like speaking of wheels and roll uh, ponds i feel like the show is going to be on a roll from the get-go because the uh, and procedural about the law can be very serious this looks more in the vein of 911 lone star and then it's just silly for the sake of being silly and you know what after some of the stuff the CW has been putting out recently, I'm looking forward to something like that. It feels like it can be an inherently CW show. We're definitely seeing a lot more of Canada than the uh, actual US show set in Canada would be because they're trying to create the illusion that we're in Central City or anything like that. But this show looks picturesque. It looks visual. It's out on the water. And yeah, I can't wait for it. It does take place in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, for as in regards to like Vanessa though, she's really owning the space of this yeah. being her vehicle. Uh, the the layers that you can even see in the trailer is amazing. Uh, to talk about unserious, like the opening shot is her pretending to be this. Well, she's employed as this lady's maid, but there's no water in the bucket. And there's no water on the sponge, but this woman just walks by like she's doing her duties, and then she just plops the the sponge in, and she's gone. And I'm she's like, like <laughs> she's like, that's done. Grabs a beer and does it, does her thing. <laughs> I know, starts to like steal, and then it's like this is just going to be really fun. I, I think it's about time we've had something very unserious on the CW mm -hmm. that's not like unserious plus a superhero drama because they've done unserious but like I think as far as like this it's the great way to introduce like more procedurals on the show. Uh, the trailer for me reminded me of how I felt for when So Help Me Todd's trailer job for CBS. I knew I wasn't going to watch the mm -hmm. show but I knew that people it's like made for a specific viewer and those people are going to enjoy it. So, like, if you like right. So Help Me Todd, it's, it, this is your show. Wild Cards is it. And I do like So Help Me Todd. Wow. Yeah, you're right. It is, like, the odd couple pairing, like, the lawyer and the hot mess son who's a detective. Yeah, yeah you're right. Mm -hmm. They knew what they wow. were doing. They took yeah. some notes from the other networks. This is a tried and true format. Like, mm -hmm. and I don't care how many times it's been done. If you can do it well with a new spin, with the right star mm -hmm. do it that i remember that day that i squealed on in an episode when you said that there would be disguises and my excitement was just to the ceiling and it's just like i loved seeing the trailer and feeling justified in that excitement like the material really matched what was promised Mm -hmm. and we did get to see some of max's disguises right. as well <laughs> <Didn't> yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. The oh i'm accent, in for the blonde yeah. wig i feel your sugar all of that <laughs> <laughs> uh like it, it is one of those shows though it's going to be like running for eight to ten weeks right it's like eight or ten episodes long cause, um, it's whatever not... it is it's not going to be enough for me yeah but... right no <laughs> but i implore I... everybody to watch it because they need at minimum six seasons so do with that information what you will. <laughs> but with it being a CW like co-production with this with CBC, can we just get a uh, like early season two renewal like right before the episode drops? If like everyone else burns can get it, and so can Sullivan's so, Crossing, can we just mm -hmm. get that for wild cards? It needs to be on long enough for Madeline Petch to make a cameo as like Max's con artist friend. Yeah, the Chonies are already manifesting i saw that on twitter i need it <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be we all need it i think mm -hmm. it'd be very cute like who can match that vibe better than madeline she yeah, does on serious so well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's a compliment by the way know, no, no shade to madeline <laughs> no i mean cheryl she, was one of the best for things seven seasons Riverdale. yeah yeah mm -hmm. that was she was Providing the comedy on Riverdale for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, uh, oh, I have a message for them all, though. Um, I know uh, more news is going to come out anyway, but like just for it to be expedient would be great mm -hmm. if we could just not a trickle, but like a wave. I mean, everybody else is giving us waves of information. Y'all can give us waves too. We love some overnight shipping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And none of this, like, it might not arrive by Christmas. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> the new year is a common folks now listen sabrina you asked for news this time last week and the wild card news is just kept common so yeah. that's specific to one show so let's just hope it kind of blows up and is, uh, revolves around the other shows too because it we've been very critical of a lot of the last year of the cw journey 
this last week has felt a little bit exciting. So anything else in that direction is a thumbs up from me. I know. I wish I could tell uh, the, us six months ago that we'd get wild cards. Yeah. It wouldn't that have been uh, something to look forward to? I think the whole pod would have just been us like raving without having seen any footage, <laughs> just only having the synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> like Christmas, the wild card is coming. Yes. But what I don't want to see in the show, and I think this is a great segue into our topic for the episode, is I don't want to see an overwhelming amount of flashbacks. Mm to Max as a child learning about cons or being on cons with her dad. Sim- something I simply don't need much of. Mm-hmm. You guys might disagree. I don't know. It's just something I don't need. But it, it is, I, I think I nailed the segue into the flashback. <laughs> <Topic. Yeah. laughs> Very yes. much. But I think, Reed, I believe you were on pod saying that you were not a fan of nonlinear storytelling in terms of yeah. utilizing the flashback as almost like a crutch to be able to explain rather than explaining in the current timeline of what's happening. Yeah. I am a staunch supporter of the linear storytelling. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And you said we might disagree. I don't. The only thing I disagree with is that we might disagree Um, because I'm a fan of show and don't tell, but I feel like a lot of shows you utilize the flashback um, formula so that they can show us things we don't need to know. Um, there's a lot of things like let's to use that could have been an email metaphor. There is a lot of episodes or of TV shows that devote things to a whole flashback so that you can learn something about the character that honestly wasn't important enough to need a flashback episode. A line of dialogue would have solved that. And to use the example we've just been talking about with wild cards, of we we know that uh, Max is going to have a rich history of learning, growing up, and learning to be a con artist. But that show's tone is kind of so unserious that I'm not sure we actually need to see it. Rather than more about hear about it and bring it up and learn about it as it goes along. Whereas a flashback episode is very specific to a specific time zone, very specific to what's happening at the moment, and at least seven out of ten times they're not necessary. So if it wasn't an unserious show, I feel like we would get one of those flashbacks of the moment when her father was arrested. And so she would just be screaming while being held back from the police while Dakota plays and it goes into slow-mo. And you're just like, how did it happen? And the whole episode is just them yeah. like rewinding the clock back 24 hours earlier, but also in a flashback. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be mad if there was like, and it was done well. And I know that's so vague and a standard that is probably impossible to meet but if there was an episode that delved in to a specific time in her life like a turning point in the whole episode was kind of like a flashback to like Mm -hmm. maybe it was that moment that her father was arrested that changed the course of her life and we could see that and it is relevant to the current plot in some way and maybe Ellis has something in his life that was a turning point. And by getting to see that, we understand maybe it's the deepening of their relationship as a partnership and a relationship. I think that would be an intriguing thing to see. But what I really don't think we need is like, she's solving a case. But in the beginning of the episode, we see a flashback to her at eight years old and her dad's teaching her like, this is how you you steal a wallet. And then later on in the case, that's the lesson that helps her solve the case. I'm like, we don't need that every week. (laughs) (laughs) It's been done. And it's like, at this point, trite. And I'm like, if they can find a way to do that, where it's not like a slap us over the face with like a, oh, everything she knows, she learned from her dad. And we're going to show you. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's unnecessary. And a lot of shows really do that. They And to, I think, both of your points, um, there are some flashbacks where it feels like the only reason it, it exists is to explain something in the current timeline. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you're right, Michael, just like a line of dialogue. Like Max could be pitch- picking a lock and he could be like, how'd you learn this? Like my dad taught me. We don't need to see the mm-hmm. moment in time where her dad was like, you put this in here and you do this and like it's we we got it we're we're, we're with you we're, we yeah. we got gotcha. you we understand 
And and that's the thing. There are multiple types of like flashback episodes or like devices and how they're used. I would much rather a simple scene like the one where you said about the like dad helping her pick a lock to highlight her relationship with her father rather than getting a big long sequence just to show us why she knows how to pick a lock. It depends on how they're used from time to time. Um, I'm you know me, you know I'm going to bring up the arrow example because it's just like right there. This is a show that did flashbacks for five years because Oliver spent five years on the island. So every single one of its commitment, (laughs) right? So every single one of its five seasons, first five seasons were devoted to Oliver, one of Oliver's five years on the island. And and now in the pilot, um, I'm sure you've all seen footage of the pilot when Oliver's first found on that island. It shows him and he's got the long shaggy hair and the long shaggy beard. um, And then he goes and gets on that fisherman trawler and he's taken back to Star City. um, And then obviously becomes a green arrow, so forth. This show knew where its flashback narrative would start and it knew five years from now where its flashback narrative would end. Brilliant. What we didn't know was where it was going to go in the middle because the writers didn't know where it was going to go in the middle either. Um, so throughout the whole course of that show, the five, first five seasons, the first two seasons full of flashbacks, amazing. Some of the best flashback narrative you ever see. But by the time you reach the third one, it's like you said, Reed. Oliver's present day arc is starting to mirror his uh, island arc. So he doesn't trust Barry Allen in the present. Flashback to some time he was stranded in Hong Kong and he didn't trust someone and didn't, didn't work that right. So he has to learn his lessons from then. And like, did, that, did they know that that flashback existed before the storyline in the present happened? Or did they just like, like, oh, we could put that in there as a flashback of why he feels this way in the present. I think that's the question I want to get mm-hmm. to. It's like, why does the flashback exist? exactly does it add anything to the story or was it concocted out of thin air because that was the issue with arrow we knew he started on the island we knew he ended on the island they had five seasons to play with whatever happened in between so sometimes having like an end game point of your flashback narrative doesn't work because two seasons on the island one season in hong kong another season back on the island and then another season in russia before he finally got back on the island like they did a lot in those five years for it worth of flashbacks and i all they had to do was just say spent five years on the island. Maybe we could have seen it sporadically, but that's because they committed to doing a flashback narrative in every single episode. They had to take the story in different directions. And it just, it doesn't always work. It just, I, we use the term that the flashbacks can be a crutch. And I think it became a crutch for Arrow, which is such a shame because I think early on in its run, it was kind of redefining how to use flashbacks because you don't see that many shows that you use them every single episode and it was doing it really well. But of course, five seasons, as like Reed said, is such a commitment and, if it doesn't add anything to the overall plot, which a lot of those episodes did not, it's like, what was the point in them in the first place? It, they start to take away from it than add to it. Yeah, I <laughs> struggled with This Is Us, which is a show which is, its format is multi-generational and it's not technically a flashback because they're showing us these timelines. And But there were, just to preface, I do love the show, so I'm not like hating on it, but um, there were certain episodes where they would flash back to the adult characters in present day to them as children and the mirroring of the the storylines was kind of like it felt contrived whereas there are other episodes that went into like the rich character histories of like certain things they went through that made more sense than s- those certain episodes and something that i struggle with when with non-linear storytelling is what am i supposed to take away from this mm-hmm well, as far as to go back to the use of the word commitment, it's interesting to say that, though, because every season they have to come up with the new storylines. And it's like, so it's like you committed to it, but you didn't really need to. It's fine to walk away from from uh, storytelling tools, resources, whatever, that don't serve you anymore or aren't going to serve the story anymore. Because, like, why commit to it? You know, like, why, mm-hmm. like, oh, we did for two seasons, we've done flashbacks, we have to keep doing flashbacks. Like, you don't really have to. We could just move, we could just move forward. I think sometimes, like, as writers, we get stuck in the way that we've wanted to do something and can't move away from um, it not serving 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 us anymore. But as far as, like, flashbacks go that I, that I really, like, adored, uh, so Walker Independence, while, we, while you both were talking, I was like, there are two major flashbacks I can remember right now um, that happened in the show. And one of them is told from the deputy sheriff's perspective. 
because he was reading letters. And that's how you find out about his relationship with Callian and how their friendship developed in the first place. And you learn about his wife too um, mm-hmm. and, and what happened there. And then of course the big reveal that Tom has been obsessed with Abby for some time now. Uh, and like that he's he was actually had actually already seen her and knew who she was from the beginning and then that way those flashbacks worked because it revealed uh, portions of the story that hadn't been told to us yet and I think that's one of the big aspects of a flashback that's necessary is a, a revelation of some kind something that turns the story on its head or ends up with a plot twist not that every flashback has to do that like in the flash a lot of the flashbacks are actually just very reminiscent about being nine and in love with Iris or being bullied, <laughs> like so, like it doesn't always. Um, they don't always serve the narrative, but in a lot of cases, at least for the Flash, the flashbacks really did work to create a a story where we we knew sort of what his life was like when he was nine and how it changed that um, that night when he saw the yellow lightning. Yeah, and that's a great example because I know Arrow got so reliant on flashbacks to show us what happened on those five years for Oliver, but dare I say the flashbacks and the flash were actually more important because we constantly flash back to that night where his mom died and he saw the man in the yellow lightning throughout the whole first season. And it's only when you get to the season one finale that Barry actually travels back to that night and they do a healthy balance of old footage mixed with new footage because he's now in the timeline. That was the ultimate payoff. That was worth it. That is why we spent so long stuck in the past because the Flash himself was literally going to get stuck in the past in the season finale and have to make this life-changing decision. They did go to the well one too many times because he ended up back in that same night in the season two finale, in the season three premiere, the season nine on season nine episode. So they definitely went to the well one too many times, but I understand why, because it was such a rich storyline. Like, we're on record for saying we did not enjoy season nine and yet one of its best episodes was the episode where Barry spent the whole episode in that night yet again. So yeah, maybe they went to the well one too many times but when it's such rich material that helps the characters, that helps the story, you can't really fault them for that. And something you said, Sabrina, about relaying information, I think is a genius way because I know I've mentioned to you guys about the show Neighbours that was on the air since 1985 and then was ended by its network in 2020. Well, obviously now it was recently revived by Amazon Freeway. That's the first time ever it's been off the air. So it's the first time ever Neighbours done a two-year time jump because we have to stay in the present day on a soap. And in the midst of it all, they decided there were, there were characters missing. There were story, the story inconsistencies. So they decided to do a flashback week, which brought back all the characters from the original series and showed you how the transitional period happened between that and the new series so that you can understand why some characters moved away, why they're no longer around. And I thought that was really effective because you don't really hear things like soaps doing that. So the fact is to lean on something that all of television has done for so long, but that your format generally hasn't, to kind of relay information that reveal why this Neighbours, a new chapter, is different from the original Neighbours. I thought that was very effective. Um, And it does go to show you that the original idea of a flashback was to add something new, was to relay some kind of new information. And broadcast television tends to get hung up on it too much because it's a very easy device to do that. And maybe we've just gotten, we've built up to a threshold. It's like, okay, here we go. Because at the end of the day, flashbacks disrupt the present day narrative. They always will. And like I said, between six and seven times out of 10, they're not always worth it in today's day and age. But if you do it right, it can be so effective. There's something to be said too about um, timing when it's deployed, not only in the season, Mm -hmm. pacing wise, but when it's right for the story. And I mean, that's if you're using it as like a flashback episode, you're not using it as a consistent storytelling device where there's flashbacks in every episode every other episode whatever but if you're going to do like a flashback episode i think there needs to be a reason why it's happening now both in the season and in the story so it's not disruptive to the audience or the narrative Mm -hmm. and again that is so vague and like (laughs) like there's no science i think it's just something you feel as a writer but one of the um flashback episodes that I recently watched and that partly inspired this discussion was I'm, I'm re-watching Revenge which I don't know if I've recommended on podcasts before I but think about if, it. Any, if anybody still hasn't watched it I don't know where it's streaming but it's a great show um, and I'm on season two but the show does kind of do a lot of flashbacks it's 
because I'm so used to the show, it doesn't bu bug me as much. There's a lot of flashbacks to the past to when the main character is a child, which it works because she's dealing with a lot of like trauma from that time. But the flashback episode that I watched specifically took place in 2006. And this is the, I think the season was in 2012. Um, but it took, it, it didn't take away from the storyline. And the thing that I loved about it is that regardless of, of if it didn't connect to the main plot, which it did for four different storylines, which was masterful in my, in my mind, because there were four complete stories told that carried over to the next episode that connected to the previous episode. It was, my mind was blown. Um, but the episode itself told a complete story. Like I was, the second I saw it was, it said like Thanksgiving 2006. I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> but like I was invested. I didn't pick up my phone once. I was like completely enthralled. And I think that's another ingredient to a good flashback episode is like as a whole it needs to stand on its own in so many different ways i'm putting so much pressure on people writing flashback episodes but i don't know i think it's about time the pressure needs to be on <laughs> <laughs> i think but like as a tool though as a storytelling tool uh, i feel like it has to it can't just be something you do because it'd be fun to revisit this period in time or it'd be fun i mean it can be that but like it's one of those then make it like a standalone and we can just that or a bottle episode and we can just really in, enjoy it that way i feel like when you use it um in a way where we're just trying to lay out the lesson of the episode it doesn't really move you you know like it's the kind of storytelling yeah. that you use that works well when you're teaching a lesson so that would be like in television that's for younger audiences, like a coming of age story or um, or even younger, like for, for school age children and preschoolers. Um, I mean, it can be effective, but it just feels like when it's television written for adults, flash, like here's how she learned something and back in the past and here how she's going to utilize it in this moment just doesn't really feel great. It just feels like we could have just, it could have been left on the editing floor. But one of the <laughs> flashback for pause the biggest one that I've seen at least in, uh, regarding soaps um as far as like the way we used a flashback to try to tease who shot someone um I hate I mean soaps do this all the time because they have to retcon things when they change direction but like in Bold and the Beautiful is a big story of like who shot Bill and his son uh, Liam was struggling because he was getting flashes of the night, which he didn't realize he had been there because he'd hit his head. Um, and he was like, was I the one who shot my father? Like, um, and so the whole, like for weeks we're like, did Le we were like, Liam shot his dad. When is someone going to find out? Liam's like, wants to put himself in jail because he's like, I have to tell them. I have to, to tell the police it was me. And then and th in order to get him out of that storyline and it not being him, you find out that it was actually his estranged wife, Steffi's mother, who shot oh, wow. Bill. Steffi's always at the scene of the crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was like, but when you're like watching as watching as a viewer, it doesn't make sense then for him to remember walking into his father's house, picking up the gun and firing it. Mm -hmm. how does he have taylor's memory they never explained because they <laughs> that, use the same footage <laughs> <laughs> yeah that reminds me to to go back to revenge the pilot episode which is chef's kiss one of the best pilot episodes that i've ever watched um it opens on a flashback where it's like setting up the mystery of the season it takes place on at an engagement party and it just we don't know any of the characters yet but there's tension between every character in the room. They're saying things. She's wiping sand off her hand. And we find out a certain, we're led to believe Daniel was shot on the beach. And we see all of the main cast members are involved in this. And then we spend the next, I think the reveal is in episode 14. So we spend the next few episodes like, but they don't hit us over the head with like, they don't ever flash back in those episodes to that moment. It's just like building those dynamics and telling the story. And we kind of like piece together like, but wait, if that happened, how did this? it like it messes with your mind? But the reveal does. It feels like once they got in the room and they found like had the 
the actor dynamics or like how the audience reacted to certain characters or like what didn't work as they worked through the story. There are some things where like, um, there's one certain line where like Emily and her, her, I want to say best friend of me, they're like besties, but like, she kind of hates him. It's a really funny dynamic. She's like, you shouldn't be here. And getting to the actual reveal of that night, I'm like, that line doesn't really work, but they still put it in the episode to like, see how all the puzzle pieces connect but i was watching it again i'm like that line doesn't really there's certain aspects of that of when they get to the flashback in real time <laughs> like don't particularly work but they were like you know what we did it we need to commit to it and we're gonna find a way to make it work mm -hmm. which i commend that's another thing i want to say is that i really commend writers that do flashbacks because simply i would not be able to mentally keep that in my brain like i want to know like do they write it down do they have a spreadsheet do they have like a map how like wild does it get because i i think i would give up <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it could it be so like a lot. Complex. yeah it can <laughs> yeah. really complicate things um and that's a good segue into what i was the show i was going to reference that new apple tv show monarch legacy of monsters which is set in legendary at warner brothers monsterverse and the godzilla and kong movies um We've had four movies now, four, right? Four, there'll be five next year. Four movies about Godzilla and Kong. The human characters weren't all that great in it because they were monster movies. And um, Monarch's supposed to be this big shady organization that deals with monsters and we don't know, knew nothing about them. So the series decided to add some background to it. It's set in two different, technically three, but mainly two different timelines. Kurt Russell is in the present as uh, the I aged... He's he very good in it, as the aged originator of Monarch. We flash way back to the 1950s and a son, Wyatt Russell, plays the same character. Um, so it's very, very healthily balanced and you can see the same mannerisms and everything. It's very, very good. Although there's an ongoing mystery because like Kurt Russell is like, he, the ca character is in the 70s, but logically the character should be in his 90s. So they're like, wait, how is this man still younger than he should be? So there's a lot yeah. of un un unsolved mysteries going on at the moment. And it shows that monarch which is a shady organization now is but in the 1950s it was started with the best of intentions as a, a a way to protect the world from monsters the very first godzilla movie opened with um the, the army trying to destroy him in 1954 and then he resurfaces in 2014 monarch is actually should, able to show the background of how the story started how they attacked him in 1954 so we get to see godzilla in the past we get to see godzilla in the present there are references to kong and all the other monsters so it I like that because I remember when I first saw it, I was like, mm, I don't know if I like the fact that it's going to be set in two different timelines because of all the flashback stuff. But both of them are treated like as with, with equal importance. It's not like, oh, can't, can't wait to see what happens in the present day. You're equally enthralled in the, the, the past arc just as much as you are in the present arc. It adds so much context to the movies as well. There's just so much going on that it seems to nail. And the fact that the writers have to juggle the two timelines with the context of all we know we learn during the four movies as well. And the fact that this is set after the first Godzilla movie, but before the second Godzilla movie, so much going on and so much to juggle. And I think they do a phenomenal job of it. And I don't know whether that's maybe just because they're not banned by the restrictions of network TV. But I just thought it was, I don't even know if you can call it flashbacks because like I said, both narratives are equal. But I thought that was one of the best examples of that because it never feels like ugh, flashback episode or anything like that. And it sounds like they they built the story with that and like that was the way they built the story it wasn't just like huh we should like flashback randomly it was like mm -hmm. no this was what the story was so I mean, yeah exactly it works, it works. exactly so when the, and the monarch pops up in the next godzilla and Kong movie you're going to understand more about them you're finally going to know who they are and what their purpose is so i think it adds a lot of context um at first when you heard about it you're like oh this is necessary after watching most of it I, I agree that it is very necessary and um, so the fact that they managed to do that with what you could consider the flashback format really says a lot about the quality of writing on that show. I want to be, though, in the writer's room when, you know, we're we're breaking episodes and they realize we're getting towards the end and we made a mistake somewhere. Right. In the timeline, <laughs> like, I want to see how they get out of it. Like, how are you going to write yourself out of the mistake? Because, you like, you overlooked a piece of information um, or the um, you didn't seed something that you were supposed to seed and you didn't realize you hadn't seed it yet. Like, I just feel the like fans that. will tell you. They mm -hmm. will tell you. Because they're living in a longer. Because, like, I, I just admitted I wouldn't even, as a writer myself, wouldn't be able to keep track of a time. <laughs> but I would yep. find out from those fans. <laughs> <laughs> 
I made it, a does, point. <laughs> it does happen from time to time. Like, wasn't it Stranger Things season four? They realized that it was Will's birthday and Joyce never wished him a happy birthday. No one ever said anything about it being Will's birthday. I think they needed to edit the date or something or edit something out of that because the fans noticed. That's where my like sitcom brain comes in because they'll be like, they'll celebrate a character's birthday one season and then like yeah. not the next season, even though each season is a a year or it'll take place they'll celebrate the character's birthday in february one season and then it'll be in may the next season and it's like <laughs> it's fine <laughs> you just have to move forward a soap opera is exactly the same way like yeah. what she was born in january but we are now here in fall and you're saying she's turning seven that's not accurate but we're here <laughs> and like sitcoms too are so oh, god love them but they'll be like they'll establish a character's age in like season one friends as an example they're all supposed to be like i mean, i don't think they established their ages in season one or maybe it's like late 20s but then in like season seven they're celebrating rachel's 30th birthday <laughs> each season <laughs> of the year what's happening <laughs> right um in the soaps over here we have something called rapid soap aging syndrome yes. and it's when a character disappears like they're 12 and then they return two years later and suddenly they're 18 and they edge them up so they can do more storylines but the soap's timeline has <laughs> just moved from 2020 to 2022 there's no that reason why that sister in the oc she was just baby shailene woodley in season one and it was like teen willa holland by season one, three. <laughs> no. I love that. My favorite version of that um, for the rapid aging is uh, as a web turns, Luke goes into the barn as 12 years old, comes out of the barn in the next episode, 16 years old. No. <laughs> like we just, and like, okay, there's a time machine back there. Uh, or I don't know, if it, does this happen as it comes to where they change who's an older sibling? Because that happened on Bold and the Beautiful I'm as well. I'm sure they have. Because uh, Liam is supposed to be the middle child on Bone the Beautiful, but then randomly he became the older child um, in one episode it was two years ago. And I was like, no, because Wyatt, his brother, came into the show with being like, I should get dad's company because I'm the oldest. He didn't know I existed, but I'm the oldest and it should go to me. I've been here five minutes, but mm. I should have this multi-billion dollar company. I mean, we briefly mentioned Beverly Hills Nine Two and at the beginning for Jason Priestley. And the funniest thing about the show to me is that the first season they're juniors, most of them, and then the next season they're juniors again because they were like, "Oh, the show's a hit. We need them in high school longer." <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> And I think that goes to show you that I think this this is a good way to bring us full circle because a lot of shows just change information for no reason whatsoever. But a lot of other shows use, utilize a flashback to change the information or utilize a flashback to make us think a certain way about something and be like, oh, that's not the way it was at all. So I feel like, you know what, sometimes you just got to go with the flow and do what you need to do. I don't I do think it can I mean, be. Yeah, if you can pull it off, gaslight me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it can be manipulative, but you know what? <laughs> Thumbs up. Go for it. <laughs> yes. I feel like that's where the episode should end. <laughs> and next week, flash forwards. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for listening. Um, let us know what your favorite flashbacks are or moments in television that had you scratching your head because they changed something that they literally had just talked about in the previous episode. Uh, but thank you for listening. Ready to be spiral. I'm Sabrina. I'm Michael. And I'm Reed. Hi, y'all.